Okay, poverty, particularly world poverty, since uh, global economic inequality is a bit more radical than uh, most in economic inequality internal to countries. But a lot of what we're going to have to say, and some of the readings, particularly the, the Kaplan, are actually focused primarily on poverty within a system. This is a bit of the culmination of discussion of different ways you might think that stuff, money, goods, resources ought to be distributed in society. Uh, and so to some extent, we're going to apply the other theories to this issue and see what kinds of differences arise. And this should be fodder for your reflection on what kind of theory of distribution is the most morally adequate. Okay, so the first question is, how wrong is poverty? We can agree poverty is bad. I don't think, um, with very few exceptions, anyone would dispute the claim that poverty is bad. At least poverty is bad for the people who are poor compared to being less poor. We can get into some discussions about things like ascetics. Um, there's plausible arguments that having too much money is also bad for you. But generally speaking, I think we can probably all start off on the page that being poor is generally not good for the poor person. But that's different from saying that it's wrong, at least on the face of it. Whether poverty is wrong or just something unfortunate depends on how you think goods in society ought to be distributed, whether or not you think that you have a moral view about the distribution of resources that entails that there ought not be any poverty or there ought not be as much poverty as we have. So let's start out by talking about that, and this will be a little bit of a summary of the things we've been talking about for the last few weeks about distributive justice. Because different distributive theories will object or not object to poverty in different ways, to different extents, and for different reasons. Uh, we're going to leave aside for the moment the non-economic effects of poverty. So whether having massive wealth inequalities in your society might lead to uh, infringements on political rights, for instance. Uh, these are important. We can talk about them later. But for the moment, we're just going to focus on the goodness and badness of having economic resources, having material resources for their own sake. Um, OK, so let's look at a few different ways that you might think about the best way or better ways of distributing things in your society. As a baseline, let's just look at economic efficiency. What does economic efficiency tell us about how goods ought to be distributed? So looking at this graph, just imagine that each square, all right, so here's how you should read these graphs. Working with a radically simplified abstract economy with, say, two people or two groups of people, each of which have um, a certain amount of resources. So uh, the light gray boxes on the left of each little uh, of each little graph is, you know, the less well-off person or group of people. I'm going to pretend it's one person for this discussion, right? But of course, that's a massive abstraction. Whereas the dark gray boxes on the right are going to be the better off people. So in this picture, the gray boxes, light or dark, represent um, bundles of stuff. Imagine imagine each gray box is a big box of money, right? So all the way on the left, we have perfect equality in distribution of money. Each person has two big boxes of money. From an economic efficiency standpoint, the only thing that matters is how many boxes of money there are in the society. So uh, if you assume you have a fixed number of boxes of money, right? If we have four boxes of money, we just arrange them however they want. From an economic efficiency standpoint, it's not going to matter whether each person has two or one person has three boxes of money and the other person has one box of money as in the middle. Um, they're equally good from an, efficient, from an economic efficiency standpoint. What's better from an economic efficiency standpoint is if you somehow are able to get more money in the system. And there's any number of ways. I mean, when we talk about this, you can imagine, you know, if there are incentives to working harder or being something more valuable to 
economic production, then uh, you know increasing inequality as a result of giving people incentives might result in sort of growing the pie, letting there be more stuff to go around. Capitalism 101, that you you know you have inequalities because inequalities drive incentives and incentives drive growth, right? So for the for the from the standpoint of economic efficiency. Pure equality is the same as any kind of rearrangement that has the same amount of money in the system, um, and it is less good than anything that has a greater amount of money in the system, regardless of how that greater amount of money is distributed. There is no particular egalitarian pressure from pure economic efficiency, except for empirical ones, right? So, as is, has been discussed a little bit before, it turns out in the real world that more inegalitarian societies might actually be less economically efficient, right? But that's purely empirical. If it was the case that a massively inegalitarian society was efficient, economic efficiency doesn't care. Okay, so utilitarians. Utilitarians are going to add another layer onto this picture, right? There's a sense in which economic efficiency is a version of utilitarianism that takes money to be utility, right? But all the other kinds of utilitarianism, hedonistic utilitarianism that uh, worries about pleasure, eudaimonistic utilitarianism that worries about happiness, or preference satisfaction utilitarianism that worries about you know, preference satisfaction, they're going to add another layer onto this. And the reason why this is important is that almost every version of utilitarianism holds that there is diminishing marginal utility of the raw stuff, the money in society. So remember, this is just the idea that should be familiar from stuff we've talked about here, that should be familiar from Econ 101 classes, that how much pleasure or happiness or other other kind of well-being, almost regardless of how you define well-being, as long as it's not money, you get out of additional stuff is a function to some extent of how much stuff you already have. A thousand dollars to Bill Gates, he doesn't notice. A thousand dollars to me is nice. A thousand dollars to someone living on a dollar a day is a fantastic boon beyond all calculation. Well, maybe not beyond all calculation, but a huge deal, right? It makes a huge difference in their life. As an aside, um, just for simplicity's sake, because how many you, how many graphs do you guys want to slog through? Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to assume that the only thing that affects how much well-being, how much utility, a certain boxes of a certain number of boxes of money gets you is um, how many boxes of money you already have. Of course, as Dworkin points out, especially there will be some people for whom boxes of money are just inherently already going to be less or more worthwhile, right? If you ha suffer from certain, certain kinds of disabilities, uh, you may need more boxes of money to be brought up to the same level of well-being as someone who does not have those disabilities. But again, keep that in mind, bracketing it for the charts, because holy crap, you don't want that many charts. All right, so how do things look for the utilitarian? Well, so imagine the blue now is utility. So you'll notice that the first box of money, you get a box of utility that is as as big, that's as good as that box of money, a box of well-being that's exactly equal in size to that box of money. When you already have a box of money, well, the next box of money isn't worth quite as much. And if you already have two boxes of money, well, the next box of money on top of that isn't worth quite as much. So. You'll see that uh, as we go to the more inegalitarian distributions, the amount of well-being, the amount of utility that the better off person gets is less and less proportionate to the additional boxes of money that she has. So because utilitarians care about maximizing well-being in the system, not maximizing resources, not maximizing boxes of money, they're going to rank things differently than the person only concerned with economic efficiency. So for the utilitarian, 
because in the system where we have the same number of boxes of money, but they're distributed more unequally, the person who gets more boxes of money doesn't get as much utility from their third box of money. That distribution is going to be morally worse than our original egalitarian distribution, where everybody has two boxes. Hopefully the graph makes that reasonably clear. All right. So as a result, utilitarians do have some pressure towards egalitarianism. They do have some pressure towards equality. Um, it's almost always going to be more beneficial from a welfare standpoint, from a utility standpoint, to take stuff away from the people who have more stuff and give it to the people who have less stuff for exactly this reason. Now, this does not mean utilitarians will be egalitarians, because notice equality is still, pure equality is still inferior for the utilitarian to the situation where um, you add more boxes of money into the system. If you add enough boxes of money to the people who are, who are well off, it will still make them enough better off in terms of utility to overcome the issue of marginal of, of uh, diminishing marginal utility. Uh, now, maybe if you could rearrange them into a more egalitarian place, you could do better. But you also might not be able to. Right? That might have to be the size of the, you know, the size of the incentive to make things work. So for the utilitarian, basically, what's going to what, what it's going to amount to is, roughly speaking. As long as you are keeping the amount of stuff in your system fixed, you have a finite number of boxes of money, or a finite number of boxes of stuff. Utilitarians are, generally speaking, you know, assuming that people are basically equal in their ability to, to benefit from things, at least in the large aggregate. Generally speaking, utilitarians are going to favor moving towards equal distribution of that stuff. But if your inequality can create enough more stuff, right? if it can grow the pie enough, utilitarians will favor the unequal distribution of stuff in the society. So next, what about the liberal egalitarians, the Rawlsians who favor the difference principle? Remember, the difference principle holds that um, you can move away from <clears throat> pure equality only if the move allows you to make the worst off person better off than staying at pure equality. All right. So you can move away from pure equality, not just making everybody in the aggregate better off the way that the utilitarians are concerned with, but only if you make the worst off person better off. All right, so this is going to lead liberal egalitarians to basically have an even stronger egalitarian tendency than utilitarians will have. So for the liberal egalitarian, the one on the left is, you know, clearly not better than the pure equality all the way on the right, because you have less overall well-being in the system, and it uh, it is not to the advantage of the of the least well-off compared to pure equality. Even the one in the middle, where in the aggregate everyone in the system is better off, this the, the version favored by utilitarians of these three, is not going to satisfy the liberal egalitarians because it still makes the worst off better off than they it makes the worst off worse off than they would be under pure equality. So of these three distributions, liberal egalitarians are going to favor pure equality. They don't care about how much stuff there is. No matter how well off you could make the better off person or the better off group of people, if the worst off people are less well off than they would be under an egalitarian distribution, doesn't count. Even if they're they're less well off than they would be under some other distribution, that's still not as just 
as the one in which the worst off people are the best off they can be. This is why, remember, it's called a maximin principle. So you're required to maximize the well-offness of the least well-off people. Now, that doesn't mean that liberal egalitarians will always favor pure equality, right? So if we imagine a kind of system where by increasing the benefit to the best off people even more, like the one on the right, that will increase the well -off, the, the well-being of the worst off people, that will be superior to pure equality, to pure equality. Right? As long as you are making the least well-off person better off by increasing your inequality, you're good for the liberal egalitarian. Okay. As an aside, um, one thing you should, should notice about this is that liberal egalitarians essentially favor a restricted version of Pareto efficiency. They don't favor Pareto efficiency from where we are right now in the real world. Because we might be right now in a distribution, we probably are right now in a distribution that violates the difference principle, right? There are more equal distributions than what we have now that would probably make the least well off better off, right? Even with the rider that we're not just imagining that you know, everything could work exactly the same if we skimmed off from the rich, right? We're not just imagining redistribution, we're imagining that we could create a new system that would lead through the workings of that system to the least well off people being better off than they are now. Um, so liberal egalitarians, they're not going to hold with the fundamental welfare theorem of basic economics that market transactions are always good because they're always pretty efficient. But if we were to start from equality, right, if we start from perfect equality, then essentially what they're saying is that just distributions are the ones that you could get to through a series of Pareto efficient transactions from perfect equality. Okay. If that was confusing, ignore it. All right. But the liberal egalitarians, the bottom line is they're going to have a even stronger egalitarian tendency than utilitarians. Um, but they still will, will ultimately accept inequalities if it helps out the worst off people. And then finally, libertarians are going to say, no, 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 no. All of this talk about how the boxes of money are distributed and who gets well-being out of that, blah, 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 that's all horribly misguided. The only thing that matters is how did these people get the boxes of money they have? And if they got them through original acquisition and voluntary transfer, then it doesn't matter how they're distributed, it's fine. So for libertarians, the question of poverty is only going to turn on essentially the question of whether or not the people who are poor deserve to be poor by the, by the rules of the system. Okay, so that's basically the three, three kinds of distribution, economic or four kinds of distribution, right? Economic efficiency, well, we can imagine five. Let's call it five. You could be a pure egalitarian, right? You could think that only systems in which everyone has basically the same amount of stuff are just. You could be a, you could care only about economic efficiency, in which case you just care about how many boxes of money there are, and you'll have no particular egalitarian impulse because you don't care how things are distributed. You could be a utilitarian, in which case you're going to only care about how much well-being there is, and you will have an egalitarian pressure for distribution of stuff because of diminishing marginal utility. You could be a liberal egalitarian who will have a quite strong egalitarian pressure because you don't mind inequality in itself, but you only will accept inequality if it makes the least well-off people better off. Or you could be a libertarian, in which case you don't care about distribution, but for a different reason than the pure economic efficiency people. The reason you don't care about distribution patterns of distribution is you think that's not what affects what what determines justice what determines justice is how did we get there okay so let's let's try to apply these things to the specific question of poverty so hold on ah 
I missed a slide. Okay, never mind. It's not an important slide. Just surprising. Let's try to apply this to the specific issue of poverty um, and try to think about what would solve the, the problem. Now, poverty is a, it's a prima facie moral problem. It seems like a moral problem, and especially global poverty um, seems like a moral problem. The basic idea, or the, the basic thing that makes it sort of intuitively gripping as a problem is that if you look around the world, there are a lot of people who are poor. Not just poorer than the people who are wealthy, but, but poor in, in ways that really seriously impede their ability to live completely fulfilling lives, right? Um, I, this is not to make a particularly materialistic claim. This is not to claim that, you know, resources and money and stuff are the only ways to live a good life, but whatever your conception of the good life is, even if it's all about family and community and that sort of thing, if you are really scrambling to find enough food for your family to eat for the next day, it's going to harm your ability to engage in all sorts of other worthwhile things that make lives worth living, right? So it seems bad. It seems bad in particular for the poor people. At the same time, there are a lot of relatively rich people in the world, right? That probably includes almost everyone listening to this. Um, so not only are there a lot of relatively rich people in the world, but it seems like probably we could take stuff from the rich people and give it to the poor people. And there's enough stuff sloshing around in the world that we could make the poor people's lives radically and drastically better without making rich people's lives radically and drastically worse. So that's the intuitive grip of the problem, is that this, this looks, at least on the face of it, morally problematic, unfair, wrong, evil, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. I think it's a, you know, you might, at the end of the day, think that, no, it's not wrong, but I think it's a very plausible intuition that there's something very, very wrong with the world, right? There's something very wrong with the world where um, just recently hearing the statistic that uh, Americans waste 40% of their food, um, a lot of that's from restaurants and such, right? It's not that you're throwing it all out, but uh, you know, individuals nickel and dime that a lot. Whereas in other parts of the world, people don't have enough to eat, right? It seems, it seems like that's probably something wrong with a world where I'm throwing out food while other people are starving. So the question is, uh, how wrong and what are we obliged to do about it? So let's start with the utilitarians. Peter Singer's a pretty good example of this. Um, and, you know, he takes off from the kind of egalitarian pressure that utilitarians uh, have on their theory. Basically, the argument is that we should redistribute our stuff from the wealthy to the poor, because the poor get more benefit from the stuff, and hence redistributing it in a more egalitarian fashion, at least up to a up to a limit point, would maximize utility. Now, a lot of people are going to complain. Well, wouldn't this be all inefficient, right? You're going to take econ uh, microeconomics, and you'll see that they're dead. If we imagine that this is a a sort of tax, for instance, there'll be dead weight losses. Even if it's charity, there'll be dead weight losses. And I think Singer is going to say, look, given the radical inequalities in wealth that there are, especially globally, um, you, could, you could have a really inefficient system that would still benefit the least well-off, right? So if you imagine, like, that I was giving $1,000 of my own money, right, which would hurt. I would notice the loss of $1,000, but it probably wouldn't change my lifestyle, right? I wouldn't have to eat lentils every day just to make ends meet. I wouldn't lose my house. I wouldn't have to pull my daughter out of school, right? Um, it would just, you know, it would notice I'd have fewer luxuries, that sort of thing, but it wouldn't kill me. Um, even if you assume that I lost 90% of that to inefficiency in the transfer, um, so that only $100 was getting wherever it was supposed to be going, right? If someone's living on a dollar a day, they're living on 300 some odd dollars a year, and they get an extra $100, right? That's huge, 
even if we imagine a 90% deadweight loss. So Singer's going to say, I think, imagine any kind of inefficient, reasonable inefficiency you want, um, still probably a fairly radical redistribution from the wealthy to the poor is going to make the world better off in terms of utility. And in particular, Singer advances um, two different kinds of uh, of principle that he thinks are, one of which at least is very morally unobjectionable and leads to massive wealth transfers, right? So the moderate principle they suggest is that wealthier types of folks like us should give away our resources as long as we don't have to sacrifice something that is morally significant at all or significant to our lives at all. So the idea here is if I have an extra fifteen dollars, um, or you know, people buy MP3s now, right? So I have an extra. I have an extra nine ninety nine. Um, if I'm thinking, should I spend that nine ninety nine on a you know a new Metallica album? Well, you know that is relatively trivial to me, right? I you know, I like Metallica. It'll be, it'll be nice to listen to, but I already have a bunch of Metallica albums. It's not going to change my life in any meaningful way. Um, it's not like you're asking me to give up uh, the money I spend on my daughter's education or the money I spend on, you know, even like books for my work or anything like that. So Singer's going to say, clearly, that, t that $9.99 would make a big difference to somebody who's living on a dollar a day. Um, and for me, the value of it in terms of my utility is small, right? Fairly trivial. And Singer says, look, we spend money on things that are moral trivialities all the time. And he thinks it's pretty unobjectionable that if we have the choice between spending money on something for ourselves that's morally trivial or spending money <clears throat> on things for uh, people who would be greatly benefited from them, right? Nine ninety nine buys a lot of salt pills to stop dehydration from cholera, right? Nine ninety nine can probably buy a couple vaccinations for debilitating diseases in the developing world, that sort of thing. Singer thinks it's pretty unobjectionable that you know we should do it, and he thinks that the only reason we don't is that we, we're typically not we don't have that kind of thing thrown in our face. Right when I go to buy the Metallica album, Amazon MP3 is not like, are you sure you wouldn't rather give this for you know dengue fever vaccines? And you know probably I, I might do things differently if I was forced to actually think about my decision every single time uh, that that I did it. But you know Singer says, look, though this if we if we argue it out seems pretty morally unobjectionable, and he thinks that if you you know. You can't really argue that I ought to buy metallic albums instead of giving money to the people who, people who are radically poor. Nonetheless, this would be a pretty significant wealth transfer, right? If you took all of the money that you currently spend on luxuries, beer when you go out with your friends, music albums, clothes that are cool but you don't really need, right? If you took all of that and gave it to the global poor, there would be a huge resource transfer from the wealthy to the poor. But actually, Singer thinks, because he's a utilitarian, that things are even, um, the real principle is even stronger than that, right? His radical principle is that you should be giving up something of, comp you should only stop your giving if you would have to be giving up something of comparable moral significance, which is quite a bit stronger, right? Um, vaccines against debilitating diseases might make the difference between a child living or dying or a child living a good, fulfilling life and living a drastically shortened and much more difficult life, right? And there, oh, there's plenty of stuff that we spend money on, even stuff that's fairly important to us, but that's not comparably important, right? So there, you might you even get into things like, well, I could send my daughter, I could we could spend a lot of money to send my daughter to a really nice private school. Or we could send her to the public school where, like, she's not going to die, right? She'll still learn how to read eventually, um, these sorts of things. It's not, it's not that bad. Well, there, you know, even though it is morally significant to see to my own child's education, Singer would say, probably we ought to, I ought to give that money to people who are much worse off. So utilitarians are going to, in a lot of ways, be fairly radical 
um, even though they don't have the explicit egalitarianism of the of the liberal egalitarians. Especially they'll be fairly radical in our actual world, given the vast disparities in wealth. But the other thing to keep in mind about them is that their view has no particular basis in any notion of desert. You're not giving the money to the poor because you owe it to them. Um, or because they did something that they deserve it, or even because it's unfair, right? The utilitarians don't care, even if the equalities in some sense are inequalities in their world or some sense are fair, right? They don't care about that. All they care about is the fact of the inequality and the fact that the inequality is harmful to the well-being or the utility of the people who are worse off. The only way that any kind of notion of deservingness or, or fairness comes into utilitarian theory is very indirectly in things like moral hazard. Right, so you might a utilitarian might say, well, all right, if we give money to people who don't work for it, then they'll continue not to work for it, and the overall amount of utility in the system will be lower. But only those kinds of indirect things matter, right? And even there, it's not about the dessert; it's about the instrumental reaction, the moral hazard. Okay, that's not going to make liberals happy. Either liberal egalitarians or libertarians will not be happy with just dealing with things on the utilitarian view. Libertarians most clearly are going to say, no, it matters a whole lot how the poor people became poor. I didn't take their money, so why should I have to have to give up for them? Right? Maybe it'd be nice of me to give up some of my stuff for someone who's poor. But it's not like I mugged a poor person to get my nine ninety nine to buy the Metallica album. So heck, if I want to buy a Metallica album with my with my time, right? Why are you telling me that with my money? Why are you telling me that I can't do that? Okay, even liberal egalitarians are going to be concerned about something like deservingness, though. Too remember, liberal egalitarians they want a system where things are better for the least well off, but they don't want a system where we just sort of let whatever happen and then redistribute the way that is at least a possibility under utilitarianism, right? They do think that people deserve things, and in particular liberal, liberal egalitarians think that the least well off deserve more stuff, right? That if you have a system where the least well off are not as well off as they could be, that means the system itself is unfair and needs to be fixed in some way. So both libertarians and liberals are going to be concerned not just with who has which stuff, but how did this happen? And what if anything in the system is unfair and should be and should be fixed? Where they're going to differ is that liberal egalitarians are going to be more open to the idea that the system is unfair just if it is such so as to create systematic inequality. Whereas libertarians are going to have a more restricted view of what it is for a system to be unfair. So Pogge proposes a few different theories for why the inequality and the poverty in the world might be wrong, wrong from a liberal standpoint, and not just bad or unfortunate uh, or depressing. So one possibility is that the rules of the economic system are unfairly skewed toward the rich, right? This is, in the abstract, basically the critique that, um, that free trade favors wealthy nations, right? It causes poorer nations to, you know, create um, single export crop economies or export resource economies. Um, you know, it, it doesn't allow them to hive out foreign competitions that can grow their local industry. Um, you know, the IMF imposes austerity measures that are bad for poor countries, whatever, right? These are the, this is the abstract form of all of those kinds of critiques that basically the rules of the system are not fair. Liberal egalitarians are going to be much more excited about this kind of argument than libertarians are in general. Um, and in fact, I think this is probably the most common reason that liberal egalitarians think that poverty is wrong, is that it's not just that people are poor, it's that they're poor because of a system whose rules are unfair. Now, given that, well, at least let's not, if you assume that the rules 
were not put there at the point of a gun, right, but are just the result maybe of unequal bargains, libertarians will be fine with them. The reason why liber liberal egalitarians would not be fine with non-coercive, or at least not sort of violently coercive, but unequal deals in the rules of the system has to do with the way they think about property. We can get into this more, but basically what's going to make a difference here is that liberal egalitarians are much more likely to regard the stuff that is created in the world, the valuable stuff, as essentially a social product. It's stuff that we all create together, and so there's a sense in which everybody ought to get a fair share of it that goes beyond just sort of what I will agree to sell my labor for. Libertarians don't, th don't think that the stuff in the world is, in a meaningful sense, a social product. It's the product of individuals, typically the individual who directly produced it. So um, my favorite, do I have time? Yeah, I have time to explain this. My, my favorite pop culture illustration of this is, um, so those of you who, who have followed the resurgence of Iron Man in the movies will know that Tony Stark, Iron Man, is a noted libertarian. Um, you know, and he's very... You know, he's a billionaire and he's a self-made billionaire and this sort of thing. Well, see, the trick to, to Iron Man is that in the world of Iron Man, he is really, in a lot of ways, self-made to a way that is impossible in the actual world, right? There's a scene in Iron Man 2 where Tony Stark goes down into his basement, essentially, and synthesizes a new element on his own, right, with like a wrench, that's not the way things happen in the real world, right? You want to synthesize new elements in the real world, you're doing them at CERN, right? You've got multi-billion dollar government system set up. You've got teams of hundreds of scientists all working together to do this. They're building on the work of hundreds of previous scientists and all sorts of things. So libertarians think that typically stuff in the real world is more like the way Tony Stark synthesizes elements in Iron Man, right? It's basically you doing it on your own, you making the major contribution. Liberal egalitarians think that stuff in the real world is typically like the way we synthesize elements in the real world, where it takes hundreds and hundreds of people all working together, and the mere fact that, you know, you were the guy who pulled the final lever or pushed the final button to make the element means very little to what is sort of a fair share of the credit of the benefit. Okay, so that aside, let's move on to the more libertarian friendly versions of the liberal understanding. The, other, the second thing uh, Togi proposes is that maybe the reason why poverty is wrong is that Wealthy countries, people in wealthy countries especially, essentially took the poor's share of natural resources. Um, this is essentially also the left libertarian line. The reason why poverty is not just unfortunate but wrong is that there are a lot of people who would be better off had not at some point in the past their natural resources essentially been stolen from them. And, you know, the typical answer is colonialism. Colonial, colonial period is when this happened. And then the third possibility, uh, which is sort of a broadening, is that maybe just in general, the people who are wealthy today are wealthy in significant part because of the history of violence and fraud in the real world, right? So I did not personally take any land from Native Americans. Neither did my parents, right? My, 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 my family came over from Eastern Europe at around the turn of the 20th century. So they didn't personally take any money from Native American, any stuff, any land from Native Americans. But nonetheless, right, the land that I was able to buy, the house that I am able to buy, stands on land in Baltimore that at one point was controlled by Native Americans that was probably, given the history of North America, taken from them at the point of a gun. Right, So, in this kind of view, just in general, this would be the view that in general, a lot of the poverty in the world has a history of violence and fraud behind it. Had there not been such violence and fraud in the history of the world, many of the people who are poor now would be less poor. So, on either of the second two views, even libertarians probably have to admit that 
the poverty that we currently have in the world is not just unfortunate, but wrong. Because it's not based on sort of a libertarianly respectable history. Well, each version of these views has some impact on, on what we owe to the poor. Right? If you think the system, if you think the rules of the system are unfair, well then you what you owe the poor is to reform the rules of the system. Um, if you think that there is some that the rules of the system are basically fair, but the, at some historical point unfair things were done, well then you probably only owe the poor compensation. But you still owe them something. You owe some kind of compensation for the, the, the things that were done and you need some theory about what kinds of bad things were done to whom to understand who owes compensation to whom. You're not going to be able to do it in a very direct way like to say, okay, well, you know, we've traced this all down, Dr. Levine, you know, you owe $5 to Sherman Alexie. But we can say in general certain sorts of things, like, well, Dr. Levine, you owe money to Native Americans and to African Americans because the kind of stuff you have now is based on the expropriation of Native lands and slavery to some extent, right? We can make some sort of rough adjustments. So, the details will vary, but any of these views for a liberal of any stripe is going to is going to say that there's either some kind of owed compensation, or there's owed compensation plus that we need to change the rules of the game in some way. Now, in a lot of ways, this might end up being similar to what happens under utilitarianism. It depends. The details might vary. It's going to be a different theory, though, right? The reason I'm giving my money to vaccinations for poor people in Africa instead of to buying metallic album for the utilitarians it's just going to be that the poor people need vaccinations for the liberals it's going to be that the reason I have 999 that I could spend on a metallic album is in part because of slavery and colonialism and so I need to pay people back for that to some extent okay now the flip side of this is that liberals do expect this will make the poor better off, right? Part of what's wrong about it is that it's bad, and so if you fix the wrongness, you fix some of the badness. But the extent to which the poor are made better off is not the direct focus of the approach. The direct focus of the approach is making the system fair and compensating for historical unfairness. Okay. The last thing we should talk about, and we can probably get into this more, especially since you're policy folks, is how exactly should we be helping the poor? Um, and here are the devils in the details, to a large extent. It's one thing to abstractly say, well, I should spend my money on the poor instead of on metallic albums, right? But there's a lot of ways I could do that. Do I, should I give money to Oxfam, right? Should I worry about NGO capture, right? Should I pay more money in taxes? Should I give money in my community? Should I go directly somewhere and give them money? Should we give people money or should we give them stuff? Um, you know, do I give money, to, do I give money to beggars on the street or is that a bad thing to do, right? Should I worry about them spending, there's all sorts of questions about, even if we agree that we have a reason to help the poor, how we should help the poor. Um, there's both going to be this very high level question about whether we focus on giving benefits to individual poor people or whether we focus on changing the social structures and institutions that make them poor, right? Again, this is a lot of the utilitarian liberal divide is going to come out in that. But in general, it's going to be a mixed empirical and normative question, right? And it's hard to give an answer. I, Pogi proposes an answer, um, the sort of natural resources dividend, um, or glo sorry, global resources dividend, I think he calls it, right? That he thinks all the different kinds of liberal theories would agree is a good one. But you, you I mean, you guys are policy guys, not philosophers. You're probably going to look at it and go, this is really unrealistic. And it is kind of unrealistic. Figuring out what kind of thing would work and also meet our obligations is tough. Um, you need a system that works. You also need one that's sensitive to the sources of poverty, right? It, one thing that is objectionable to a lot of folks, even folks who want to help the poor, about utilitarian approaches is that they're often pretty, they're often too straightforward, right? Singer doesn't think of himself as 
insensitive to the sources of poverty, but he's primarily focused on, you know, people should give to charity, not people should smash capitalism, right? Or even people should advocate for fair trade. I think he likes those things, right? But the focus of his thing is just, the focus of his views is just about pure redistribution. And a lot of people think that that's, that's not the right way to go about poverty if the problem is that the system is unfair. That would be the kind of right way to go about poverty if it was just a matter of poor people had been unlucky in a basically fair system, right? Well, you help them out because you're nice. But if the system's unfair, a lot of people think that that's not sufficient. It doesn't express the right things about poverty. Um, you also need a system that imposes justified sacrifices on the rich. This is the libertarian complaint. Libertarians can say, yeah, it's, look, it's horrible that some people live in poverty, but what means that I should give up my stuff? And, and what says that this is how much stuff I should personally be giving up? Again, there are libertarian-friendly theories that justify some kind of changing of the rules of redistribution, but not the same way. A lot of libertarians will argue for a sort of trade-not-aid approach to, um, to foreign aid. To, uh, to helping the global poor in general, right? They'll say, look, the problem, I, we agree, the system is unfair, but the unfairness in the system is not that we're not giving enough money away in foreign aid. The unfairness in the system is that, you know, we have trade barriers and agricultural subsidies that make it hard for African farmers to compete with American farmers. Maybe if you twisted their arm, they would say, okay, we should pay some comp maybe some sort of compensation for the historical injustice, but the basic way of solving the problem is open up free trade, right? Probably that will make, and many libertarians will say, probably that will make the poor better off. Um, and if it doesn't, well, at least then they'll be sort of fairly poorly off instead of unfairly poorly off. But the only sort of justified sacrifice you could impose on a wealthy person would be something like saying, hey, you, wealthy American farmer, you have to give up your subsidies. You couldn't say, unsubsidized American farmer, you have to give up some additional money. And finally, and this is a little bit connected with some other things, you might need a system that respects the poor. Um, I know some people who receive welfare uh, in the, you know, um, they receive AFDC welfare, or, ah, oh, crap. I always forget whether TANF went away and was placed with AFDC or the other way around. Apologize for the acronyms. Social people, please correct me. Right, they receive food stamps. They're on the SNAP program, and one of their complaints is that it's humiliating to go get these things. Right, you have to go to people who clearly don't want to deal with you. Um, you know, you have to. People make you feel bad about the fact that you're using it. Right, if somebody sees you using your food stamp, your SNAP card, um, you know, to buy what they see as quote unquote luxury items, they sort of sneer at you. Um, so we need a system that doesn't just give people. Poor, arguably, we need a system that doesn't just give poor people stuff, but that respects them. And this is actually one of the advantages that many liberal egalitarians and, and libertarians will claim for systems that focus on making the rules fair rather than giving people extra stuff. And even the issue of respect is contested, right? Um, a lot of people who are sort of more liberal egalitarian or even utilitarian leaning will say, look, this is how I respect people who are poor. I respect them by giving them stuff that they need. But as a couple of the readings point out, right, you can give people stuff that they need while being very disrespectful to them. On the other hand, you have folks like Brian Kaplan, who I had you read, um, partly because he addresses this question of who is responsible for poor people being poor in a contentious way. Um, but partly because he would say, right, you know, a lot of people read Kaplan and they're like, oh man, this guy is such a classist, you know, possibly racist kind of, you know, word that I shouldn't say to my class, right? But if you read other of his writings, um, or, uh, you know, what he'll say is, no, 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 this is exactly the opposite. I am respecting poor people by assuming that they have the same kind of moral powers that anybody else does. And it's the liberals who, you know, the liberal egalitarians who go, oh, you know, if a poor person fails, it's not their fault that are disrespecting them, is treating them as less than human. So this question of respect is deeply embedded with this question of how ought we try to get our system of distribution to be a better one? 
Um, and the final question I'll leave you with is just a lot of the theories we've talked about are ideal theories. They talk about what would be the best way of distributing things. What would be the fair rules? Um, our world, of course, is not one where we're starting from equality and adjusting. It's not one where we can assume that there's no history of violence or fraud. Um, and so there are some deep policy questions about how do we get from our non-ideal world to a better one, and what, if anything, do any of these theories tell us about how to do that? That we can talk about later.